Pat Salmon, and I'm here today at the Olmsted Beale House off of Highland Boulevard in the Eltingville section of Staten Island. Today is Thursday, May 28th, 2020, and I'm here to talk about a fellow by the name of Erastus Wyman. But before that, I want to just say that I'm part of the Friends of the Olmsted Beale House, and we're working to restore an historic structure that was first started in around 1682. And we still have that structure today, and it is now the Olmsted Beale House, and we're working to preserve it, get it back online, and we're just working our tails off. So if you ever want to become a member, please do so. But I'm here today to talk about a specific person. He owned the house for a very short time. His name was actually Erastus Wyman. And here's a picture of him. I don't know how well you can see it. Well, Erastus was born in, uh, excuse me, in Canada in 1834. And as a youngster in his teen years, he went to work as a, a newspaper boy delivering newspapers in Ontario, Canada. Eventually, he got a job with the Toronto Globe where he was a printer's devil. And by the time he was 21, he was already the financial editor of the Toronto Globe. He had a mind for numbers and figures. And, and sometimes, this, one time his numbers were questioned. And boy, he made the person who you know questioned his numbers look not too bright. So he was, he was a sharp cookie, this Erastus Wyman. He went to work for R.G. Dunn & Company. You got that right? done in Bradstreet today. He went to work for them around 1855 in Canada and only 10 years later he was promoted and he was sent to New York to run the Manhattan office. So he was only about 34 years old and here he is running the Manhattan office of Dunn and Bradstreet. So it's 1865, the United States is, is all in a, a, a excitement because the war is finally over the civil war is over things are starting to happen and it was in that year 1865 that he came to staten island he grew to love staten island especially the open spaces he liked to do athletic things and be outdoors and and he really grew to love this island he also had big plans really big plans he actually started thinking about ways to improve Staten Island, to build up Staten Island, to, uh, you know, make it a sort of a commercial center in opposition to Manhattan. So he started to get involved with transportation. Now, at, at this time in the 1870s, we had one rail line. It ran from Clifton to Tottenville. But we also had a number of ferries that ran on the East Shore. They ran from Stapleton, from Clifton, uh, from Tompkinsville. The North Shore, we had even more uh, ferry lines running to New Jersey, going from uh, Port Richmond and Marinus Harbor. Well, Wyman, as I said, was a sharp cookie. And he realized that if he could consolidate all these ferries with this railroad that existed on Staten Island, this was a good thing for Staten Island, for Staten Island's future. And he went to the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, and he said to the president, Robert Garrett, uh, Mr. Garrett, I have this fabulous idea. If, if, if you listen to me, I wanna show you Staten Island. I wanna bring you out here and show you what can be done. The Baltimore and Ohio Railroad had a big problem. They could not get into Manhattan along the Hudson River. It was all taken over by the Pennsylvania Railroad. So the Baltimore and Ohio had no quick avenue into Manhattan, and that's a problem. When you have a big railroad, you need to get your goods into Manhattan. So Wyman, again, sharp cookie that he is, he says to, to, to Mr. Garrett, if we can get control of this little railroad on Staten Island that runs from Clifton to Tottenville, if we buy up these ferry lines that are running from the East Shore and the North Shore, and we consolidate them somewhere around Tompkinsville, and then we start a new railroad that runs along the North Shore and goes all the way to the Arthur Kill River, your train lines, your, your Baltimore and Ohio train lines, can come over a railroad bridge to Staten Island, go along the North Shore Railroad when it's open, and then come to this new town that I'm going to develop where you can put the goods on the boats and get them over to Manhattan, solve all your problems. 
Wyman went right to work with the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. He established this, this terminal point that we now call St. George. He established it in 1886, and he had the, the North Shore Railroad line and the East Shore Railroad line meet there, and that is where he established ferry service. So the run that you know today as the St. George to Whitehall line was actually established by Erastus Wyman. As part of Erastus Wyman's plan to sell railroad tickets and to sell ferry tickets, he set up a number of establishments and, and uh, recreation activities on Staten Island. So let's go take a look at, at the house because the house played an important role in Mr. Wyman's plans. So come along. Can I ask a question? Yes, you can, Eileen. So you said uh, played a role in the St. George to Whitehall. Is that Whitehall taking into Manhattan? Exactly. That run, the ferry run that we know today, that you go to St. George, you get on that boat, it takes you over to Whitehall, South Ferry, whatever, right there. Um, that is exactly the route that he established. There was no St. George before Erastus And we're still Wyman. taking that same route. There you go. <laughs> and there was no, there was no route there. People were taking ferries from Tompkinsville to Manhattan. They were taking ferries from Stapleton to Manhattan, from Clifton to Manhattan. It was a, it was a mass confusion, so to speak. So he consolidated transportation on Staten Island. He got the Congress to actually approve that tunnel that exists today by Lyons Pool so that it could go under the Lighthouse Depot and meet the North Shore train at St. George. Excellent. Right. So as I said, he started to um, establish all of these extravagant plans on Staten Island. And one of the plans that he established was bringing a professional baseball team here. And he built a state-of-the-art stadium right by where the Staten Island Yankee Stadium is today at St. George. But this place was gorgeous. It was Queen Anne architecture. It could accommodate 3,000 people. And professional baseball. The first New York Metropolitans played at this stadium that Erastus Wyman had built in the St. George section. Hey, it was 1886. You bought a ticket. You could watch as the Empire, excuse me, the Empire. You could watch as uh, the Statue of Liberty was being installed out in the New York Harbor. Best food of the day, steaks, just like you got at Delmonico's, all at a good price. He brought electricity to Staten Island. He got electricity at the stadium. He had a, a, a magnificent fountain that he established at St. George. You have to remember, there were people who were, they didn't know about electricity. They never saw electricity. This was so exciting. And there were all these colored lights with this huge fountain. It was a kaleidoscope of color. And people came to St. George to watch the Metropolitans, to see the electric fountain, to get a good meal at the, at the stadium. It was, it was just great. He established Aristina, a little area out on the border of Marinus Harbor and Elm Park. And he had Buffalo Bill's Wild West Show come to that area in 1886. In case you don't know what Buffalo Bill looked like, here's a fabulous, which didn't print very, very well, but a fabulous picture of Buffalo Bill. So Buffalo Bill, Annie Oakley, Sitting Bull, they all come to Aristina for this magnificent shows where they do all kinds of, of uh, shooting, marksman, marksmanship activities, and, and they have battles, like they have soldiers battling the wild Indians out on the open field, and there's like stadium seating for like 5,000 people here at Aristina. Um, it, it was very exciting, and, 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 but the main reason was to get people to buy tickets on the North Shore Railroad, to get off at the Aristina stop, go see the show, buy tickets at Aristina, buy ferry tickets, because he had people coming from Manhattan and Brooklyn even to see these shows. They, they said that there was even like an opening night, a few thousand people were in Aristina to watch Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. So it's really, uh, uh, he brought all these crazy things to Staten Island. 
He also established the train route that ran from Clifton to South Beach. He wanted South Beach to be the next Coney Island. So, I mean, he did that as well. I mean, the, the number of things he did on Staten Island is amazing, really. But he bought this fabulous house. By, by 1885, Erastus Wyman owned this property that we now know as the Olmsted Beale House. And he bought about 124 acres that ran from around Amboy Road all the way to the beach. And he had this dream of turning it into a sort of a, a, a bed and breakfast. And they would actually outfit fishing parties. And they would have all kinds of boats and uh, fishing rods and bait and everything at the shoreline. Um, he set it up as a day resort where, where like fresh air fund kids could come out. As a matter of fact, one of the first times anybody ever came here was in the early summer of 1885. A few hundred fresh air fund kids came out to, to spend the day here and they there was a some kind of a like a puddle like pond and they loved the pond they loved the wildflowers they picked all the wildflowers <laughs> the city kids so they picked all the wildflowers then they went down to the beach and they went frolicking in the water and cooled off nice but he also had performances here on the property you know he was he was in, involved into Shakespeare. So on occasion, there would be a Shakespearean show out here. As a matter of fact, that's where Woods of Arden comes from. It comes from the Shakespeare play, As You Like It. And that's, it was, according to Davis and Lang, it was Wyman who set it up as the Woods of Arden, who first named this place Woods of Arden. Uh, he called this the Woods of Arden Inn. You would take a, a, a train, hopefully get a, a ferry ticket first, get a, get a train ticket, and you'd come out to what they called the Woods of Arden Station. But I'm pretty sure it was really the Eltingville Station, and they'd have a stagecoach over there to meet you, and you would be driven here to the Woods of Arden Inn. And um, as I said, he outfitted the house. Let's go take a look at it a little closer. He outfitted the house for all kinds of fishing parties and activities. Sun, uh, Sunday school groups would come or women's groups would come or, or whatever, and they would spend the day here. He had, again, the, some of the best food that, that could be had at that time was served here. People would, you know, say, oh, it's the best steaks there. And again, they compared it to Delmonico steaks. Everything was a comparison to Delmonico's in the 1880s. But um, he bought the house and now Dr. Ackerley earlier owned the house. He had put a porch around it, but Wyman uh, always improving things, always changing things, always have grand plans, brought the porch out to those far pillars that you see over on the south side of the building. So he extended the porch out, the veranda. I shouldn't even call it a porch, it was a veranda. He outfitted the house with all this beautiful fretwork. As a matter of fact, we have, a, 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 Tina Kasman has uh, salvaged and kept safe some of the fretwork that Wyman actually put on the house. I think there's about five or six pieces of it have survived. So of course we're hoping that when uh, we can get the house, you know, op opened again and back in order, we're gonna maybe, maybe this can serve as, you know, um, a template for establishing and creating more fretwork and maybe we can have it look like it did back in the old days. So um, he, as I said, Wyman had all kinds of great plans and um, there was a problem though. <laughs> um, as I said, he was involved with the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad and the man who ran it was Robert Garrett. And it seems that Robert Garrett uh, got very sick and his, his sickness affected his mind. So the people who took over the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, they really were not too excited about having this, this entrance into Manhattan through Staten Island for whatever reason, I don't really know. But um, the problem was that the Baltimore and Ohio stepped back from all these grand plans that Wyman had. And meanwhile, Wyman 
had bought all kinds of waterfront property that he thought would serve as warehouses for the Baltimore and Ohio goods. He bought all kinds of property out in Shore Acres. He had property in Great Kills. So he was also hoping to maybe make money on all of this real estate that he bought. But when the Baltimore and Ohio pulled out, he really had some serious financial problems. He was very, he was, a lot of his property was mortgaged twice, not just once, but twice. So he had some very serious financial problems. So we see that around 1894 or so, he, uh, he owes his creditors piles and piles of money. So his, his everything he owned was eventually assigned to a man by the name of uh, John Bennett King. So if you look at the 1898 atlas, you'll see assigned Erastus Wyman, but assigned to uh, this John Bennett King, who's supposed to hold everything in trust until it can be sold and the creditors can get paid. So Wyman, uh, then in 1895, he's accused of writing a check um, in the name of R.G. Dunn and Company, who he, he only stopped working for the year before, and he was not supposed to write the che check, so he was brought to court and he was convicted of you know, writing a bad check and a check from another company and a company that he wasn't even working for. So he was convicted and he went to jail, but um, it was brought before a higher court and the conviction was overturned but he was never the same after that and a lot of you know people talk and you know i mean they called him the king of staten island before all this happened and even when the the baltimore and ohio took over the ferry service they put two new boats on on the line between saint george and whitehall one was called the robert garrett one was called the erastus wyman and after 1895, Wyman never really believed that he, he couldn't reestablish himself and, and get back on track and, and again be the king of Staten Island. But one day he was taking the ferry to Manhattan and he saw the boat formerly known as the Erastus Wyman. Had the name had been painted over and they called it now the Castleton. So he kind of knew after that that his career on Staten Island was over. But all of this to say that um, he lived to be, uh, uh, excuse me, he had a stroke in 1901. It left him incapacitated, it affected his mind, and he just like hung on for the next three years. He lived in St. George, finally on February 9th, 1904, he had another major stroke and that was that. He is buried in Silvermount Cemetery on Victory Boulevard in the Silver Lake section of Staten Island, along with his wife. Now, what, what about the property here? As I said, it, it, Wyman tried this, making it a bed and breakfast. It appears to be for about two years. And then he started to advertise it in various newspapers as being for rent. So he would advertise this great kitchen that was available in 1888 and 1889, uh, 1890. And I came across dozens of ads for people to rent the place. And then I see where the, the, the the evening world says that it was abandoned for a while and it's still for rent. And they even have quotes of Wyman saying, I had some of my best business deals there at the, the Woods of Arden. And, but it never really picked up again. Uh, a couple of people came and tried it, but it was, it was really hit and miss for a number of years, mostly miss. And, um, you know, eventually John Hales bought the property and fortunately bought the property and didn't knock down the old structure but you know instead he, he bought it as an investment property so again a, 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 as we've been saying today it is known as the Olmstead Beale House the friends of the Olmstead Beale House is working to bring the the building back have programs here hopefully exhibitions someday walking tours we're, we're hoping to get our program schedule back on track again in the next few months and um, you know we're really excited about it and Really, really thankful that, you know, it's still here and that, you know, we, we, can, we can work to preserve it. Well, thank you, Pat, and, and thank you for sharing so much that I wasn't even aware of, of Erastus Wyman. Okay. I happen to live on the corner of Wyman and Driggs, so That's there it. you go. Now there I know more go. about the man. Thanks.